Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jazz. I'm one of the CP Solvers uh, Academy members. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Loomis and Dr. Justin for a special VMR today, highlighting uh, the, uh, the United Memorial Medical Center Family Med Program uh, affiliated with the Rochester Regional Health. Um, I've actually worked with some of the residents here, and I think they're all very bright and um, have their own very unique personalities. Um, Liz and I actually um, know each other from our University of Rochester days. Uh, she was my attending um, and she uh, and I worked on a very exciting case which will always be etched into our hearts um, and we're actually published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. So I think that was a very special bond uh, that we shared. And then one of my best friends and uh, co-chiefs is an attending there. She's actually on the Zoom call here, uh, Dr. McEwen. Uh, so I'm very excited to uh, have Justin present this case today. And I think Yusuf, Jimena, and Yaz are going to do a fantastic job discussing it. Um, so I'm very glad that uh, we were able to share this spotlight for a family medicine program. And you will learn today that family medicine is just as special as internal medicine. So I'm going to share, I'm going to uh, sh uh, kind of swing the pendulum over to either Justin or Liz. Justin, if you want to go first, kind of introduce yourself. And then Liz, you can follow through afterwards. Hello, everyone. I'm Justin Unkingo. I'm a second year family medicine resident at United Memorial Medical Center. Um, this has been a really interesting case. I'm really excited to present it. Um, we were talking about what we do outside of medicine. I have a golden retriever. Her name's Ruby. I love playing with her. And I also play music in my freeze time. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Loomis. I'm the program director for the Family Medicine Residency uh, that's part of Rochester Regional Health in Batavia, New York. So kind of midway between Buffalo and Rochester, if you're kind of looking at the state. Um, I, I I completely remember Jazz as an intern when I was his attending being like, I would really like to do grand rounds. And I was like, you are a brand new intern, um, but sure, we'll do grand rounds. And then that went on to publishing and more grand rounds. Um, so I'm just very excited when I'm working with a resident or anyone who's excited about learning more about a topic, um, exploring deeper a patient that's presenting in an unusual way. Um, and so I think uh, when Jazza asked about, like, did we have any cases for the clinical problem solvers, I thought immediately of Justin's case that he had just presented. Um, and I think it's going to be a really great one to have today. Uh, besides, you know, being excited about education, I have a 10 year old daughter and a wife and our daughter's having her very first sleepover at our house tonight. Uh, so I guess getting ready for sleepovers with 10 year old girls is, is what I'm doing today. So um, love hanging out with my family, love plants and gardening uh, and excited to be here today. Amazing. Uh, Yusuf and Yaz and Hamina, if you want to introduce yourselves quickly before we start the case. Hi, everyone. I'm Yusuf. I'm a resident at Emory, I'm PGY3, also going into hospital medicine. When I grow up, I also want to be like uh, attending Jess, who uh, is a very, very special member of the clinical problem solvers. Uh, very, very excited to discuss the case with Hamina and Yaz today. Hi everyone, my name is Jimena. I'm an IMG from Guatemala. What I love to do in my free time is listen to podcasts or watch TV shows related to crime. I love it. <laughs> and also spending time with my dog. Yay, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Jasmine and I'm an IMG from Mexico and I also love plants. So anybody has plant tips here, we can exchange some. So. Yeah, super excited to be here with you. All right, and last but not least, huge shout outs to uh, Ashutosh, who's gonna be doing the teaching points today. And then I believe, um, uh, I think it's Shreyas who's doing scribing. So Shreyas, whenever you're ready, uh, you can share the screen. And then Justin, you're, you can begin whenever you're ready. Sounds great. Okay, so chief complaint is going to be a 21-year-old male presents with altered mental status to the ER uh, in the evening. 
So 21 year old male presents to the ER after concerns of seizure. The mom witnessed the patient having convulsive episode. EMS was called. The patient had been in a reported post-ictal state, but came to and was quite agitated. Um, he actually required ketamine and Versed so he would be transported. An initial exam was unable to evaluate the neurological function as he remained sedated from medications. He was easily able to be awakened. Wow, thank you for this very, very rich, adequate. Uh, Jimena, do you want to give us your first thoughts, then I'll give my thoughts, and then the next adequate, yes, you can start, and then I'll do after, and then we keep alternating. Okay, you can go, Jimena. Sure, that sounds great. Um, well, I think that altered mental status, uh, we have learned that the mnemonic mist can help us, you know, guide it through what are the causes of it. But I think I, I want to point out from the beginning that when it comes to alter mental status, like it's really important to look at the time course as Ravi has taught us, you know, like that missed mnemonic, it's gonna be more oriented to acute causes. And uh, we also have learned that if uh, we have like a sub-acute uh, until alter mental status uh, presentation is prob probably missed is not going to help us a lot. Um, this is a young patient, obviously here, uh, I would be concerned, you know, and I would try to prioritize behaviors related to young people like toxins, um, and intoxications. I would put that, you know, high, uh, on my differential. Also with the story here of, uh, um, having a seizure, I think that it's important to, um, identify this was really a seizure because we're because when we have that story we're always thinking was this a seizure or was this a syncope so I think that just clarifying that with the family and uh, in this case because we have witnesses would help a lot um guiding us towards our thinking yeah thank you man I really like your thoughts about identifying whether this is really a seizure and uh a lot of uh, studies have tried to figure out what data can we have that can help us identify if this was a seizure or not. And a lot of times the history relies on having a bystander either watching or taking a video like Drew mentioned in the chat or somebody seeing the event occurring. And uh, otherwise it's very, very hard to determine if this is actually a seizure. There are different uh, exam maneuvers that can be helpful. For example, uh, tongue biting, if you can do a physical exam and check to see if the tongue has been bitten, that has a, a good positive likelihood ratio for seizure. But otherwise, like you're mentioning, Jimena, it can be difficult to uh, identify the etiology. But pairing it with altered mental status slash confusion, I think uh, gives us, uh, makes me more want to think about trying to localize, could this be an intra-CNS issue? Uh, and as we know that syncope does not typically have a prolonged phase afterwards where the patient is confused, although uh, uh, seizure does. So uh, I'm very, very eager to know more about the history and uh, Yaz, I, I wanna hear your thoughts afterwards about the patient's age and your initial thoughts. Justin, back to you. All right, thank you. Um, so after this, He's resting in the ER. Um, his BP, or if we're gonna go with um, family history, oh. no significant family history for seizures. Um, he, from a be health related behaviors, he smokes marijuana daily. He smokes cigarettes daily, about two packs a day. No known allergies. And for his social history, he works in an automobile factory. Past medical history. 
doesn't have any significant medical history. Doesn't take any medications. So for his vitals, temp was 98 Fahrenheit. Pulse was 110. BP was 112 over 62. Respiratory rate of 12. And so for his general exam, he's sleepy but arousable. For his head, there is no evidence of bruising, no lacerations, no tongue biting, which is a really excellent point. Cardiovascular, he's in regular rate and rhythm. Or well, tachycardic, but regular. Pulmonary, no concerns, clear to auscultation. Abdominal exam benign, no hepatosplenomegaly, no abdominal tenderness. So besides his sleepiness, there's no other concerns. He's learn oriented times four at this point. He's moving his extremities spontaneously, no significant muscle weakness. Cranial nerves two through 10 are, or two through 12 are intact. And then there is no evidence of injury or traumas to his extremities or skin. Yeah, thank you. I think we can pause right there before we get more information. Yes, I'm gonna start, give you the floor to give us your thoughts initially. Thank you so much. I really like uh, the first uh, discussion in the first, during the first adequate and the chat has really amazing thoughts. Uh, in this patient, after listening a little bit more of his past medical history and exposures, um, the first thing I am setting myself in is this patient is normally, uh, or I would assume he is exposed to fumes, uh, to heavy metals, to toxins. Uh, they also mentioned CO2 uh, poisoning, but as well, I would think about cyanide poisoning. I'm wondering if this patient has like oxygen saturation. Um, Dr. Justin? Because uh, something that I will look at when I see a patient with AMS, not only like this young, not only I will look for glucose, explore, like you talk, like all the panel, uh, I will also look at his uh, oxygen saturation specifically after thinking, well, this patient may develop uh, an occupational uh, disease such as, um, I don't know, fibrosis due to silica exposure in antibiotic factory, or as we mentioned, CO poisoning or, or cyanide poisoning will have a lower or a misread uh, oxygen saturation. Um, but the next things I would be looking at will be the labs. If there is especially like a anion, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, if there is high lactic acid, if there are like electrolyte dysfunctions, of course the glucose, because I'm thinking more that there's this is an imbalance and not really a, a like I would not really uh, focus on infections, even though I would love to. Uh, but uh, yeah, those are my first my first thoughts. Like I need to see if this patient um, has uh, like how how are his uh, lights and oxygen? What do you think is it? Yeah, yes, I really like how you were. And in, in your mind, you're breaking down the n missed mnemonic and you're prioritizing uh, metabolic causes and toxic causes over uh, structural causes and maybe over infectious causes. I, I think I agree with that is, uh, because uh, 
initially the, the presentation is very hyper acute. It sounds like the patient was doing fine and then was suddenly found to have uh, this uh, encephalopathy slash seizure. And then we get the information that the patient is uh, moving all of their extremities spontaneously and no, no clear deficits on exam. This is not sensitive for a stroke, for example, this could still be uh, a small stroke or a uh, structural cause like a small mass or a uh, an abscess, for example, only because uh, focal seizures can generalize and they can cause encephalopathy. But I don't, in my mind, I don't imagine a large structural lesion because with large lesions, I would anticipate that this would be associated with at least some deficits. Although here we see some uh, encephalopathy, but no clear uh, deficits on the exam. Uh, in terms of uh, infectious causes, I agree with you. It's like, we don't have any fever. And I think that was the thing that sort of leaned us towards not, uh, uh, not think of infectious. But if this patient had a fever, uh, that would completely change our differential, wouldn't it? And Or if the patient develops a fever, it would completely make us think, oh, I want an LP right now to rule out uh, meningoencephalitis or a viral encephalitis. Uh, so I think we have heavy, heavy reliance on uh, fever, uh, but although uh, if we don't find any other clues, we can come back and think about it and we can keep this in the back of our minds. Is, could this always be an uh, viral encephalitis, for example, or other etiologies? Uh, we also don't know if the patient has any risk factors. For example, we, uh, we don't know if they have HIV or their uh, other uh, immune risk factors that may put them at risk for uh, infectious causes. In terms of exposures, uh, uh, I think it's very interesting because uh, we use the framework for young patients. It's like uh, uh, bad luck, bad genes, or risky behavior. And uh, in this case, you're, you're thinking about the exposures. And uh, I agree with that. It's uh, that uh, working in an automobile factory might put uh, patients at risk of being exposed to fumes, uh, to chemicals in general. So it would be interesting to ask about their occupation and where they spend some of their time. The other thing that could be uh, contaminated is also the uh, marijuana. Uh, this uh, has been uh, occurring around the, the, the nation in the U.S., and uh, especially that it's not regulated. There's uh, Marijuana can be uh, contaminated with uh, pesticides, with solvents, with inorganic contaminants, and even infectious uh, uh, things. So I'm, I'm like you. I'm, uh, I would want the initial workup, and I'll be looking for clues for uh, anything that's affecting... Uh, any contaminant I would want, for example, an ABG, check a lactate, and uh, just look for clues as to what is the etiology of uh, of this presentation. But I, I'm very worried about this patient, uh, as you are, especially with this uh, significant uh, encephalopathy. Uh, as Rabia always says, if at baseline you have some encephalopathy, some dementia, you're more at risk to develop ultimate metastasis. But in this 21-year-old male, who I anticipate did not have any baseline uh, mental issues, I think they would it would take a significant derangement for them to be confused. Uh, therefore, I am worried about them. So uh, I'm uh, eager to know more, Justin. Thank you again. Wonderful analysis. So for his labs, his uh, complete his CBC was normal. Um, no leukocytosis, no levels of anemia, no thrombocytopenia. His CMP was significant for mild hyperkalemia at 5.2, mild hyperglycemia at 122, mild hyperkalemia at 112, magnesium was 1.8, AST, ALT within normal limits, ALKFOS also within normal limits. Creatinine was uh, 0 0.8. Proponents were not done. Because of the level of encephalopathy, they also tested alcohol, Tylenol, and do the Utox. Tylenol level was normal. Ethanol was normal, as in not positive. 
Utox was positive for cannabinoids and benzodiazepines, but he had received those in route. And then the rest of his work, uh, the rest of those labs were all within normal limits. So because of this, they did a head CT. No acute intracranial abnormalities, mild sinusitis. Chest x-ray didn't have, oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, chest x-ray was normal, EKG was normal sinus rhythm. By this point, his heart rate had come back down to 89. Wow, thank you so much. Hey, Manon, this is a uh, abnormally normal aliquot. So, uh, l l let me know your thoughts. Um, <laughs> I totally agree with you. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I always think about the, and, and I said this on, uh, I think it was Tuesday, um, there's equal value on the positive things that also on the negative things. And as we were talking to, you know, um, and, and you mentioned, for example, infection. And now with the CBC, well, we don't have fever. We don't have a, a elevated CBC. Uh, so that can point us that probably this is not infection. You know, um, I we were thinking about the glucose too, like this glucose, it's also like not really remarkable for us to think that it's the, the culprit of this altered mental status. So we can just start ruling out there. Um, I would like to get the sodium because I think that from the electrolytes, like that's the only one that we miss that could also be causing this. Um, and I guess that I don't, I don't have experience of how the talk screen is in the US. Maybe you can guide me a little bit more, Yusuf. But for example, with the benzodiazepines that were positive, is that just a qualitative or it's a quantitative Um test so we can just think that oh if, if if the value is low like probably this is just the benzos that he was giving in route or maybe if it's like really really high we can think oh maybe benzo intoxication was involved in the past so i, I would like to ask you that question so usually it's not quantitative usually it's qualitative and uh if, if they've been given you expect it to be positive Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Can I jump in with a, a point on the talk screen? Because it is one of the areas I'm very passionate about. It really depends on the institution. And so knowing what is covered and how it's covered is super important. Um, for So our ER um, talk screen is, um, is, is not qualitative. It also does not include fentanyl. Um, or And the xylazine test that someone mentioned earlier on is very rare to have in most places that aren't doing research on it. Um, the fentanyl does not come up to be a problem, um, just so you're not like, oh, that's a red herring she just gave out. But I really like that point of understanding when they say like something like a tox screen or like a panel of something, um, being very much aware of what that includes and what it does not include. Thank you so much for that information, Dr. Loomis. Um... And, and I guess that the only thing that I was missing to say, you know, about our discussion is that our transaminases are within normal limits. So that just also tells us that if we're dealing with uh, a toxic agent, this toxic agent probably is not affecting the liver. Um, but I would be curious to just keep on trending them because we don't know if, because this is hyper acute, it's not affecting them yet or just it's it's really not involved. But what are your thoughts, Yusuf? Yeah, I, I initially the I was hoping for a clue on the initial uh, lab screening, but I don't think we have any clues. We have some clue in the hyperchloremia, which uh, can, uh, as Yaz was mentioning in the chat, we had a case last week where uh, an ingestion will cause pseudo hyperchloremia, including like bromide and uh, other over the counter uh, medications that can cause that. But uh, there's no like uh, slam dunk diagnosis that's coming to my mind. But 
given the normal CT scan and the normal initial labs, I think this is where I would want to activate my uh, uh, framework for like hyperacute encephalopathy in someone who is young. So in general, I'm uh, thinking of uh, viral encephalitis, like you all mentioned prior, is uh, could be an is a common etiology. Uh, other things I think of are uh, NMDA encephalitis, which is associated with malignancies, especially with teratomas, ovarian carcinomas, so on and so forth. Uh, another thing I uh, think of is the Hashimoto encephalopathy. Uh, and the last thing is uh, toxin ingestion. Uh, in addition to those, I can also think of uh, congenital disorders, which might not have been captured earlier in the patient's age. So although a uh, ammonia test may not be helpful in all situations, and someone who has cirrhosis and they're just coming in for a uh, cirrhosis exacerbation, for example, I wouldn't necessarily want an ammonia level. But in someone who is young and uh, has not necessarily been uh, diagnosed in the past, I would uh, want to consider getting an ammonia level just to see if they have a congenital uh, ammonia disorder, for example, or if there's a toxin that's causing ammonia to be uh, uh, elevated. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, exposure, I think I would also ask for history and uh, try to see if, uh, if they have any particular exposures that uh, they have in that uh, in their occupation. All right, thank you, everyone. So, with this next section, he ended up feeling better and left. He didn't want to stay in the hospital. Uh, it, we have a neurologist in town. They wanted to follow up with him. So, the physician, the ERs, went over all the risk and benefits, and they decided to leave. So he followed up with neurology about two two weeks later. Neurologist tried to get a little bit more uh, history from the seizure that the patient had lost consciousness, that the mother said that he was stiff and shaking, but he was not incontinent of bowel or bladder at that point. Um, he did not have any sort of prodrome. He didn't have any auras. He had no olfactory gustatory hallucinations prior to losing consciousness. The exam at the neurologist was largely unremarkable, five out of five muscle strength in all extremities with normal tone. No atrophy or fasciculations. DTRs were one to two plus throughout. Sensation to light touch intact. Coordination also intact. So he ordered an MRI. The MRI showed no intracranial abnormalities, but did show mild chronic appearing sinusitis involving the left maxillary atrium and the ethmoidal air cells. He also ordered an ENG, EEG, which was normal. So after this visit, they didn't start him on any seizure or anti-epileptic medications because it had been a one-time incident, but unfortunately it wasn't. So a month later, he presented to the ER for concerns of a seizure after his mother had heard a bang after he fell down the stairs and she had found him convulsing. So they did another CT head there. There was evidence of high frontal scalp tissue swelling, no evidence of hemorrhage. CT cervical spine showed no acute findings, but again, labs were largely unremarkable at this point. So Neurology was called from the ER who recommended to start anti-epileptics with Capra 750 BID and follow up with the neurologist again. He also ended up following up with us, uh, the Batavia primary care team. And so he ended, so he had a physical exam then, uh, blood pressure was 120 over 80, pulse was 77, SpO2 of 99% in room air. But there was an interesting finding at this point where he had skin irritation bilaterally on the hands and fingers with multiple well healing, approximately five millimeter ulcers. So if I could take this opportunity to show everybody and I could share the screen. This is what this fingers look like. This, this, and this were all present but we're healing at this point. And he wasn't really sure how he had gotten them, but they were there. They weren't painful anymore. They had mostly healed, especially if this is the most evident one. And so I'm gonna stop sharing at this point. We wanted to do a little bit more testing, but I'm gonna leave it here for now and let everybody to kind of try to discuss what happened. Okay, I think this is my turn. 
Um, so it's very interesting to see that this patient still had seizures. And now I am trying to situate myself in, again, is it because of, of the recurrent exposure? Because I'm assuming he still goes to work to the automobile factory. To the second bucket, I will think about, is this a structural issue that for some reason we can't see in the MRI? Uh, or three, uh, is this a autoimmune disease that is also causing uh, this uh, multiple skin ulcers? What I'm thinking is like vasculitis or an AV malformation or um, something that could be predisposing this and have a, cause a negative uh, image. That, that, those are my three buckets in this patient. Now for the workup, I'm not very sure of what else could I be doing other than possibly an extended uh, tox, uh, toxicology panel and um, an autoimmune uh, panel, like see antibodies specifically, uh, ANCAS, to see if there is any kind of um, issue because I don't, I don't see what else we can do. If he has normal imaginology. What do you think, Yusuf? This is really puzzling, I love it. Yeah, I, I think it is uh, definitely puzzling. I think in, in this aliquot, the presentation changed from a patient who's presenting for an acute presentation for a first time encephalopathy and seizure to a patient who presented for encephalopathy slash seizure, returned to baseline, and then had another episode. So it's either a chronic and worsening or a intermittent presentation, so which definitely would change my lens or framework and approach and we uh, uh, of course have to uh, include the rash that was uh, we just saw uh, and the general things that I'm thinking of are uh, like I mentioned before could this be a perineoplastic uh, phenomena it's still on my differential uh, although I don't uh, I can't explain the rash necessarily at this presentation unless it has like an associated dermatomycite for example uh, in terms of the other big category of things that I'm thinking of was uh, is uh, vasculitis, uh, especially with the uh, presence of the sinusitis. We don't see any uh, uh, fingerprint on the kidney or in the lungs, but it is definitely something that can be insidious and that can be missed and can, can be an image negative etiology for uh, neurologic uh, presentations, for example. Uh, Imena was mentioning in the chat that we definitely need an HIV and uh, syphilis workup. I think that's. Uh, I think we should get that on everyone in uh, many presentations, and I, I agree with that. Uh, in terms of the rash, I uh, I'm not exactly sure what what to make of it. The uh, the general thoughts I had were uh, could this uh, could this be something like a Initially, I thought, could this be like a mechanic's hands with uh, antisynthetase syndrome, for example? Although I don't uh, the, associate uh, recurrent seizures uh, with it uh, as a classical presentation. Uh, other things I thought were uh, dermatomyositis, like I mentioned before. Uh, these are my big thoughts. And then vasculitis in general. Any other thoughts, Jimena and Yaz? I'm just going to add one thought, like that I just put in the chat, like, Maybe we're thinking about searching in the head, but what if this is a problem outside of it, like the chest or the abdomen? Now that you mentioned a perineoplastic syndrome, again, exposures, <clears throat> sorry, these exposures can cause a lot of um, malignancies. Uh, that's a big deal, like environmental exposures. So uh, maybe there is a clue, but I would like to hear him at a talk. Um, I think that Yusuf mentioned pretty much everything, and I love your idea of just looking somewhere else. Uh, that's amazingly creative. <laughs> um, the only thing that I would add is uh, nutritional deficiencies. I think that that's something that we haven't considered yet. And I was just remembering yesterday's case <laughs> of uh, Mark. You know, uh, we had a, a vitamin C deficiency. So I would just wrote that in here because um, that's something that we haven't considered yet. And, you know, we haven't evaluated like, or we haven't known, we just don't know about like what's 
the patient's, you know, status when it comes to eating, you know, well, he's a mechanic, maybe he doesn't have time to get like very healthy food, he's young. So th those are the things that I would also like to ask uh, at the bedside. So I, I think it sounds like the discussions want like potentially a uh, more imaging uh, and maybe a testicular exam is a, it's like a common at this age. And uh, the next step I think could would potentially be a lumbar puncture, uh, especially with this like, recurrent uh, question mark seizures and cephalopathy. I think that could also help us elucidate whether we have to consider any infectious causes or subacute infectious causes slash perineoplastic and so on and so forth. And uh, and sorry, just to complete the discussion, what I did not mention as well is uh, acute uh, uh, demyelinating disorders or uh, acute uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis, which uh, just to complete the my differential for uh, the acute encephalopathy in someone who's young with the seizures, but although the CT is negative. All right, so I'm going to show one more picture, and I want to to say that because of the sinusitis, he was having some congestive issues. He also ha was having some nosebleeds. They sent the uh, neurologist had sent him to ENT, and at that point, they did. They had found this. There was a perforated nasal septum. So I'm just going to kind of let that hang out, and then see what everyone else wants to talk about it. Yes, uh, I'm going to have you start the discussion for this one. Oh, my God. Um, well, uh, I think that uh, all the chat. Wait, I think it was not my turn as much as I discussing. I think it's. Oh, OK. okay. Amen, you can go first then. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, sure. <laughs> I think that uh, just like by this finding, uh, this finding and the age of the patient, past history of using drugs, like we can definitely think that this patient is using cocaine uh, as uh, one of the differentials here. Um, I I can't remember right now um, the name of the molecule that's combined with cocaine, um, celestine, celestine. Maybe you can help me, Yusuf. Yeah, so uh, fentanyl is typically uh, laced with uh, xylazine and uh, uh, cocaine is typically can be laced with levimazol as well. And they oh, both can cause, can cause uh, ischemic uh, things. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. So right now I'm thinking about that and, and that maybe I, I am really not familiar with uh, how levimazol can like present, you know, as an intoxication, but I would definitely consider this. Um yeah, what, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think I, I'm thinking of the mechanism of septal perforation. A lot of times it's uh, it can be uh, an abnormal vasculature and the abnormal vasculature can cause ischemia and the ischemia can cause predisposed to septal perforation. And I wouldn't necessarily anchor to uh, substance use. So that's definitely on my differential, I agree. But... Uh, uh, to broaden it even further, the other big etiologies include vasculitis, like GPA, for example, uh, causes septal, can cause septal perforation due to ischemic changes in the nasal septum and can cause other findings that we have here. The other uh, things, other like infections can cause this as well, for example, uh, chronic uh, syphilis or uh, uh, TB can, uh, can also cause a similar vasculitis, vasculitis and can cause uh, perforation. And uh, in immunocompromised patients, I think of uh, acute fungal infections, although we don't see that here. And uh, so I'm, uh, uh, these are like my general thoughts. And the other uh, etiology could be traumatic, like if the patient's having any particular trauma of the nose. Uh, so uh, what would you want next, uh, Yaz and Jimena? Oh. Well, uh, just before like saying what else I would like, um, I think that to add to the uh, nasal septum perforation, DDX, we can also think that there are tumors like granulomatosis, granulomatous process like non-Hodgkin lymphomas. 
Um, but I'm still trying, again, trying not to anchor, but I think we shouldn't uh, discard the industrial poisoning, industrial uh, fumes can still <laughs> damage the septum. So um, I think that for me, the workup would be, again, just not just because we like ID, but like syphilis, of our panel, uh, TB, and uh, yeah, like, Again, uh, a little bit more of like you talks. What do you think, Camilla? Uh, well, I'm totally there with you. I think that um, as Yusuf was explaining here, uh, vasculitis can be like a really good explanation uh, towards what's happening. So obviously, like all that panel, I. I still would like to get the HIV and the syphilis because I think that the HIV would totally change uh, what we're thinking. And then like syphilis is like the great mimicker <laughs> and we haven't gotten those tests. Um, so that's probably what I would like to order besides of what you guys are, are talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I like it. And uh I agree with the uh, HIV syphilis, maybe like you said, the ANCA and then an uh, screening. Uh, the, the chat is blowing up with like other rare causes like Whippets ingestion or chronic inhalant use, which uh, I don't particularly know how to screen for other than history or if there's like a send out test that we can send, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so everybody kept asking for syphilis and HIV. He's not sexually active, um, but because of that, and then there was insistence upon the mom to test for heavy metals. We were all talking about his working conditions and possible exposures. So we ended up testing. Um, copper was normal, mercury was less than one, zinc was normal. So at this point, it was really kind of stumping a lot of us. So we were, we were trying to figure out what to do next and I wanted to see what everyone else would come up with. And just want to clarify, the next aloquad will reveal the final diagnosis. Just one comment, maybe more heavy metals, because I also remember, maybe I'm anchoring and just this being anecdotal, but last time we <clears throat> heard about like uh, toxicity that were out of the panel, the initial panel was actually with Dr. Jazz with a, um, Cobalt, I forgot the metal. Oh my God, so sorry for <laughs> for a hip. But yeah, that's definitely like a expanded pan chromium. That's thank you, Anmol. And uh, the expanded one and antibodies. Those are like my two buckets. What do you think, Ivan Yusuf? Where do you, where is your money? Well, I think that, uh, um, as I mentioned in a different aloquad, like um, nutritional deficiencies is something that we haven't evaluated. So I would be curious of just sending that, you know, because we're, um, we're kind of running out of tests <laughs> to get to the vinyl diagnosis. Um, so I would, I would include that. What about you, Yusuf? Yeah, I think I'm. I also don't have like uh, one unifying diagnosis per se. Uh, I'm uh, excited to learn more. I I would also want to like screen for heavy metals and uh, take it from there. I'm excited to learn from you, Justin. Thanks, everyone. Um, someone mentioned lead, and that was also normal. That was three point six. But the final diagnosis was his chromium level was eight point nine, which was quite elevated. So at this point we were trying to figure out where it was coming from and how, how did this all happen? And he, part of his job at the automobile factory was part, he was a chromium plater. He would have to wear gloves, he would have to wear personal protective equipment, and he would be dipping these large sheets and panels into large vats of chromium. And that was how he was getting exposed to it. The other part of this is that he did not have the best hygiene. So despite multiple insistence on how to clean and how to, how to take care of himself afterwards, he was still coming home with chromium all over his fingers. And then he was touching his nose. He was also smoking. So maybe that had something to do with all the exposure for him.
Oh wow. Justin, do you want Oh, so, Justin, you want to share? Do you want to share your teaching points before we, uh, before we get uh, Yusuf, Himena, and Yas to reflect? Because I thought you had some really good teaching points that you shared on your slide there. Sure. Um, so the biggest thing as we're talking about this is the dermatological effects that chromium can have on the skin is quite an irritant. Um, there's actually something called chrome holes, which is penetration of the skin causing painless erosive ulcerations and delayed healing. That's what was found on his fingers. Interestingly enough, this is also known as blackjack disease. Back in the gold mining era where there was a lot of gambling going on in the West, oftentimes the felt would be lined with chrome salts and multiple gam and people who were gambling a lot would end up wrapping their knuckles on the tables and ending up with these holes that was all from the exposure to the chromium. And there's also this case, it's an irritant. So as he's exposed to it without cleaning himself and he's smoking, it was actually causing irritant uh, irritation to his nasal septum, which on top of that was causing the erosion in his nasal septum. But the interesting, um, and then when we're looking at the mild hyperkalemia from the initial evaluation, there's a venal effects that can occur when you're exposed to severe levels of chromium, where um, it can lead to damage in the PCT and um, actually cause a renal tubular acidosis. It also affects the liver. Um, you can have elevated LFTs, but despite multiple CMPs with no L uh, AST or ALT elevations, it seems like he was not doing, um, there was no damage to the liver. Um, and so this was such an interesting case that I ended up referring it to the toxicologist at University of Rochester. He was really concerned about the patient's hygiene, his exposures to the chromium, and he quite insisted on him leaving the uh, factory. So he actually only worked there for a year. After he had left the chromium factory or the chrome factory, he ended up not having as many frequent seizures. And he's kind of, he hasn't been seen in the office for about eight months at this point, but hasn't had any complaints at this time. I think we are all public flabbergasted, as Dr. Ravi would say. I am. Um, I really thank you for this. I really like the the clinical pearls and how something like occupational exposures have to. I think we also have a role <clears throat> in trying to uh, promote better uh, measures, like safety measures, because. This is definitely something that I just wonder, like, what is next for the patient? Will he have to get those like little plugs? Will he be able to afford a surgery, a plastic surgery, and all those uh, uh, consequences on our patient's life? Uh, what do you think, Hima and Yusuf? Well, I, I am super excited about this case. I really need to uh, thank you guys because I, I feel like in general, heavy metals or just like metal toxicity, it's kind of like very sneaky and like different, like difficult to catch. Uh, but thanks to this case, like in my mind now, I have like a better idea of how uh, chromium affects and how it would present, you know, in, in case I have a, a case in the future. Um, I think that looking back, like we did have a lot of clues, you know, in the, in the history. And as Dr. Justin was just like telling a little bit more about the story of the patient, I was thinking, you know, it's really important to see the patient yourself. Cause I think that if we would have had the patient in front, probably like we could have inferred like a lot of tiny details that would have guided us more to, uh, putting the money on like his job and the exposure that he has there. Um, so the value of just having the patient in front of you, I, I think it's, it's really tremendous. Yeah. I, I just also want to thank you, Justin, for giving us not just the teaching points, but also the historical uh, perspective on chromium. I think that is amazing and even helps us remember it even more. Uh, it's very unfortunate that the patient had this exposure at, at their uh, occupation. And uh, in this case, you know, when they say, when you hear uh, hoofbeats think horses, in this case, the horse was chromium because he was working at the chromium factory. Uh, I think it's unfortunate. And uh, I hope this case doesn't like occur to other uh, factory workers. I, I imagine this is like a difficult thing to work with. Uh, 
And I'm very, very excited to finish this case and go read some articles on chromium toxicity. Thank you so much for bringing it. Thank you everyone for listening and thank you for having me. Awesome, great job, Yaz, Jimena, and Yusuf. You guys did an amazing job discussing the case and Justin, you did a great job of presenting. Um, so let's turn it over to the, let's put the spotlight on the program. So um, if anyone has questions for the program, you can post in the chat. And while we're waiting for questions in the chat, I'm gonna turn it, turn it over to Dr. Loomis and ask one question. And that is, what do you feel like is your most favorite part of your program? Oh, goodness. I mean, I we are just finished up our interview season, and I feel like I maybe was asked that like a lot. <laughs> and my answer every <laughs> time <laughs> is the people. I think we really have just like a great group of residents, a great group of faculty, people who really care, um, our staff are, are really just wonderful. You, um, so that that's my absolute favorite part of the program. Um, you know, kind of second to that, one of the things that I really like as being a faculty member is watching like our residents develop as they come in as interns, um, you know, fresh out of, of medical school or other training and um, and really just like get a lot of confidence and a lot of like passion through their time in residency and come out the end um, as as just like wonderful doctors. So I would say that's my second favorite part of our program. And Wegmans. And someone, yeah, I was, was going to say someone posted in the chat Wegmans. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know what Wegmans is, it's like this super nice, uh, like an affordable like grocery store which I initially when I first came to Rochester I was like I didn't really understood the hype behind it but now I'm totally behind the Wegmans train um my anyone else that had any just questions left, my wife just left in the middle of this to go shopping at Wegmans <laughs> <laughs> actually I I would really like to uh, hear more about the uh, like Rochester because uh, I am guessing Wegmans is like a, a, a supermarket or something. Oh, like yes. that. oh yeah, because here in San Antonio we have H E B, so we're always talking about H E B, H E B, but it's like a supermarket. Uh, so yeah, like I would really like to hear more about your city, like uh, how like easy to go around. Uh, these types of things because economically uh, and moving everything represents a very big deal for new residents so absolutely well Justin do you want to give a perspective as our as our resident of course so Batavia is 30 minutes from Buffalo 30 minutes from Rochester so it's smack dab in the, between two bigger cities and it's mostly a community rural setting and I have the joy of living in town. Um, it's more of a suburban landscape and it's been a wonderful time being here. Um, it's a great place to raise dogs, have kids, families. And on top of that, it's a really more close knit community where you go to the, um, if you're working, you also have the joy of seeing your patients outside of the clinic and like they know you and you actually get to form these bonds and you actually get to really be close to them. Um, a few of our residents live in the town, Batavia, and then most of the other ones live out in Rochester or near Buffalo. And so that commutes about 25 minutes and it's not a terrible commute either way. The only thing is that the weather can get, get um, snowy. So being in Western New York, a lot of us have ever felt the lake effect snow and the cold and when it, the wind chill makes it feel like minus 20 and that can be a little bit daunting, but the thing is, there's such a beautiful landscape around here, and it's a really good time in terms of being able to practice medicine, focus, and as Dr. Loomis was saying, really kind of grow into who you are. It's nice to know that, too. Uh, sorry, Dr. Loomis. Were you oh, I was just going to say, I, I feel like I was just hearing someone say, well, you know, you pick which natural disaster you feel the most comfortable with in the, in the country. So we don't have to worry about hurricanes. We don't have to worry about tornadoes or oh. floods. It's just the snow and the cold. I feel very comfortable with that. That that like has some more predictability to it. I think yeah. there was a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, yes, go ahead, sorry. 
No, no, no. I also see a good question here, but I, I'm wondering if uh, Shrusti, sorry if I say your name wrong, if you want to mute and ask your question. Uh, you pronounced it correctly. I was, hi. I was just wondering what the nightlife is like uh, where you all practice. Justin, you're gonna have to answer that. <laughs> um, so nightlife, there's a few local bars. Um, for the most part, it's there's live bands at one of the bars uh, every Friday, um, and then trivia is usually around some bars Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays. Um, there's a few restaurants. There's a sushi place. There is mostly like new Americana kind of restaurants, and there's a bunch of brewing companies around here. So if you're looking for karaoke or clubs and everything like that, that doesn't really happen around in Batavia, but there's areas in Buffalo and Rochester that have that have, um, can cater to that need. Uh, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Yeah. And I would like to just add that, like, coming from a big city like Toronto, um, I was very impressed with how many great restaurants there are in um, Rochester and even Batavia. Like every Saturday when I when I'm in attending at, at Batavia, they order in food from like local restaurants in Batavia, and the food's always really impressive. So uh, I don't know if it's just this area, but uh, with the number of restaurants they have, they're all top notch. Well, and Toronto is not very far from us either. Like, um, like three and a half hours to us, would you say? Um, where like from my Batavia? parents live is actually like. Yeah, from Batavia, it's actually two and a half hours oh, where wow. my parents live. But if you want to go downtown Toronto, it's probably around three, three and a half. Oh, yeah, Rochester is really good Ethiopian food. I think everyone's making me hungry. <laughs> and like yesterday, I just drove out to Buffalo to have dinner. Um, there's an Italian contemporary place that had a really good um, mushroom dish and a really good bolognese. So there's a lot of things you can do around here. That's really nice to hear. Um, now, turn a little bit more towards the program about like the tactics, research. Uh, we would love to hear more about those grand rounds with Dr. Jazz when she was in her jazz. Um, one of the uh, one of the th highlights of our program is we do have a lot of people from an osteopathic background. Now, I'm an MD myself, so I was not trained at all on any of like the osteopathic techniques, um, but both Dr. Jazz and Justin are both DOs. Um, and so that's been a wonderful learning experience for me and for our MD residents. So I'll highlight that kind of unique thing about our program. Um, we're one of the few kind of um, community-based programs in upstate New York that do have the osteopathic recognition through the ACGME. And so our didactics do have carved out time um, to teach uh, on osteopathic techniques. Um, in terms of other things, I mean, we try to have just a really great, well-rounded curriculum. Um, I have a lot of our local experts who come and do didactics. We have carved out teaching times on Thursday afternoons where it's the full afternoon where we go over our, like our core clinical topics. Um, we do um, our procedure workshops and and other types of, of our resident presentations, which is where I first heard about this case from Justin was when he was giving his mystery case for the month. So um, so that's that's kind of really the big time that we have our formal didactics um, because a lot of our clinical experiences are a little bit more spread out. Like our hospital isn't that far away from our office, um, but we do have rotations that happen in Rochester and the surrounding areas. So we really try to protect Thursday afternoons, we grab everyone and bring them back into our, our, our uh, classroom and have that time all together. Uh, in terms of research, it's a lot more, uh, we're part of a, we're not part of a university, we're, we're a community program. So our research tends to be a lot more quality improvement type projects um, or a lot more like kind of education focused. Justin wrote a great article on podcasts uh, with some of his other residents and one of our faculty members. Um, we A lot of our papers are like case presentations or reviews. We participate a lot with the New York State AFP and their journal um, and tend to be publishing articles in there like every other edition. So um, I would say a lot of our kind of research is less the big 
kind of university like grant funded and more kind of quality improvement case based or or review type projects. Thank you for all this information. Honestly, I think that also research in like medical education and improvement podcasts. I think CIP is always really big also in that area. We have really many members that are very interested in those uh, topics. So it's always good to know uh, all this uh, availability in, in the program. And to be mindful of your time, um, any other like information, tips of your program, city? Is that anything that you wanted to add? I think that the program does a very good job of providing what you want out of it. So with a rural community setting, you are it. Um, when I came here to this program, I realized that you walk into the room and you are the doctor. There is no one else with you. I, obviously you have your staff and your faculty and your attendings like Dr. Loomis and Dr. McEwen, shout out, she's listening, um, that they will support you. But you go into the room, the patient looks at you and they're in distress and it's doctor. And that's a huge commitment. That's a much different responsibility from where I trained in New York. Um, where you were one of a gaggle of medical students, residents falling around on bedside rounds. Now you're thrust into this very um, heavy position and you're it. And that was a very um, interesting perspective and something that you don't wanna take lightly. And that sense of responsibility and accountability is something that I think all of us, especially in this program, when you first come in, don't really realize, but then are able to rise up to you and it makes you feel a lot more ownership of your patients and it makes you feel much more connected. Thank you for this very valuable uh, insight. Uh, listening about your program, being very supportive, having DOs, having MDs and uh, um, possibly you as INDs or INDs. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> Uh, but definitely, definitely is something that we all appreciate to hear, to listen. And again, uh, being very mindful of your time. We already got to the hour and a little bit minutes. But again, thank you, Dr. Jazz. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. Justin, um, for coming here. All of you, Hime, amazing discussion. Yusuf, thank you for helping us <laughs> coming through this. Uh, I think we all have lots of uh, things to read about chromium toxicity, uh, space repetition, very space one. <laughs> and uh, okay, so um, without further ado, thank you so much. And please come again. Uh, thank you again for having us. Yes, thank you so much for having us. It's been a great experience. Have a great <laughs> thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye.